Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacob. I pastor here at our 40th Avenue campus, Yakima Foursquare. As you recognize, I got someone up here with me. Uh, this is Vinny. Vinny is uh, one of our youth pastors here, and uh, he has been going through the process of getting his pastor's license, and he completed that to all of our surprise. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, this is awesome. This is a huge celebration. You know, I was just, I was just thinking down here, uh, it was close to four years ago that I invited him to be on my junior high team for Anthem Junior High, and I put him up on stage, and he prayed, and he didn't know how to close his prayer, and so he just said, yeah, and that's about it, and uh, he, just, he just reminded me that that's really funny uh, to now that I'm handing you uh, your pastor's license. But before I do this, I want him to tell you a little bit of his story and what's led him to this place now, so I'm going to hand you the mic, and you go ahead and do it. Thank you. I'm... Super honored, just very humbled to be up here, and uh, it's just been crazy to reflect on um, the past few years of my life. On, I mean, if you had told me I was going to be a pastor in four years, I would have just laughed at you. Um, I grew up in a Catholic church. Uh, my my dad passed away when I was 11, and and after that, I just became super angry at God and and kind of everybody in my life, and um, that just took a big toll on me. And uh, just didn't want anything to do with God at all. You know, 11 years old, how could you take my dad from me? I was serving in the Catholic Church at that time, and, and my family was was following Jesus, and um, I believed in a good God, and, and he took my dad, and I just got angry, and fast forward, I went through high school and middle school, and um, in reverse orders, went to middle school, then high school, um, but I just got really angry, I was always getting in fights, um, suspended, and just, just angry at life, and I didn't step inside of a church for about 14 years, um, I went on Easter and Christmas, just kind of satisfy my family's um, needs for that, and uh, through all this, I, I uh, started using cocaine and drugs and alcohol and, and just became very depressed and angry and got involved with gangs and um, found myself in jail and uh, was just living a life that was destructive. Um, and I was invited to this church by a friend of mine, and I, I just think it's, it's crazy. He doesn't even come to this church anymore, um, but he, he invited me, uh, pursued me. Every every week he would text me at like 6 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, hey, let's go to church. And I'm, I was mad at him because the church doesn't start till 9. Um, there's no reason to wake me up at 6. Um, but I just was so grateful for him pursuing me, pursuing me. And I came here. Um, and if you don't know, growing up in a Catholic church and four-square church is very different. Um, I got out of the car and I was dressed in um, slacks, dress shirts, covered all my tattoos up. And I got out and I saw people in football jerseys, baseball hats, um, I got inside the church finally, and there's a coffee shop. You guys brought coffee in here. I was just like, what is going on? This is not a church. This is not great. People are talking. It's, there's drums. Um, it's crazy. Uh, but uh, I just was, I, Dave's message that morning was just he was very vulnerable about where he was and, and what God did in his life. And um, through this, I had gotten some trouble with my life, and I was, I was facing some prison time um, for some, some stuff I got caught doing. Um, I was going to an encounter at that time where I met Jake. I had no idea he was the pastor's son here. Um, so I was kind of spilling my, my life story on him about how I was in jail and I'm going to prison and I'm drugs and alcohol. And then I find out he's the pastor's son. And I'm like, he's never invited me back to this church. Um, instead, he invited me to serve um, at the junior high. And uh, so through all that, I was, I was saved from prison, uh, an encounter from a, a guy at a men's breakfast at 6 o'clock in the morning that I didn't want to come to um, he helped me out, and I was able to walk away from prison time with nothing. And um, at that time, I was very happy, as you could imagine. Um, I was at a, a worship service in Puyallup, and it was crazy. I was driving with Jake, and I said, last time I was on this road to Puyallup, I was literally in a, in a bus going to jail. Um, and I was at Foursquare in Puyallup, and I was worshiping during an ordination service, and I just heard the Holy Spirit tell me that it was me that saved you. Um, and it's now it's time to go to Bible college and become a pastor. And I said, absolutely not. Like, that's not going to happen. Um, and I was just obedient. And through that, um, I, I listened. I went to Bible college for a very short time. And I got offered a position here. And um, God is just so good. And I, and I was reading a, a quote the other day about how I thought that faith would always just take away my pain and my, my problems and all my hardships, but literally faith is just telling me that I'll sit through that with you, and that's what it's been this whole time. So I want to thank you guys and everybody here. Well, Vinny, I, uh, I officially will hand this over to you. Last service, I had to throw it to him off the stage because I forgot to hand it to him. Um, 
this is a huge celebration, you guys, because here's the reality is Vinny has already been ministering to our students for close to four years. Um, and I'm handing him a piece of paper that now says he can actually do it. That, that, that's, that's not a reality. But what this is is saying, Vinny, you, have now, you now carry the mantle of pastor. And um, you've gone through the work, you've done the study, and we're so proud of you. And uh, now we as a family, because this is something we do around here, is I have some anointing oil, and we're going to pray him, because while he is already pastoring, he's now stepping into a season saying, I carry this mantle of pastoring. Um, and we want to be his family and support him and pray over him in that. So if you feel comfortable, extend your hands towards him as I pray and anoint him with oil. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Vinny, God, and the story that you have written in his life, God, that all the plans that he had set up for himself weren't part of the purpose that you had lined up. God, and I just pray that in this season, Lord, as he steps into uh, this, this mantle of, of carrying his pastor's license, Lord, that you will bless him in that, God, and continue to remind him of where you brought him from and where you're taking him into the future, Lord. Um, we see bright things uh, currently happening in his life, Lord, even brighter things coming in the future, God. So bless him uh, and encourage him on, his, on this walk, on this path that you have laid out for him, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. That thing's heavier than it should be. Um, you know, this is fun for us because, you know, having Vinny up here, having him tell your story, it's fun for me because I got to be part of that. I loved that first time he was sitting in encounter with me and telling me all this stuff. And I'm just like, mm -hmm, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. I did invite him back. He kept coming, obviously. Um, but we'd say around here that a disciple is someone who loves God, loves people, and serves the world. And that's also the pathway to become a disciple is by learning to love God, love people, and serve the world. And Vinny as someone who is a disciple of Jesus. He loves God, he loves people, and he serves the world, but he had to go through that process. Uh, and it's fun now to be on this side of things and see uh, and remember the steps that he took and to see where he's at now. And the reason why we do things like Rooted, as Austin was talking about, um, and the reason why we have the Soma Institute, which is our, our partnership with Northwest University that Vinny is actually pursuing his degree in right now while he's pastoring, um, is because we believe in developing people. And it's not just developing the next generation of leaders because we're doing that. We're raising up junior hires and high schoolers and young adults who are going to change the world. Um, but we recognize that at any stage in your life, you are a world changer. Um, and you got to believe in that and you got to walk in that. So my encouragement to you is if you've not done Rooted, if you didn't go through Rooted with us to sign up today and get into those groups. Um, and then secondly, if... You know, it's the end of our year with the Soma Institute. They're heading off to Cambodia in a couple weeks. And uh, uh, but it's also start it's time to start thinking about next fall. And uh, maybe it's your time to go back into school or to start school and pursue a degree while you're serving in the local church. So uh, if you're interested in that at all, find me after service. I can give you some information. Uh, we're starting a series this week uh, that is entitled um, When God Doesn't Make Sense. Um, and, uh, you know, for me... I want to start this is this last month has been really awesome around here. Like, if you've been here for the last month, you recognize we had our men's retreat and our if gathering, which were awesome. We had our rooted celebration, which was the, the culmination of our rooted groups. We had people being baptized down here, signs of their new lives being transformed. We had everybody who was uh, being commissioned to, to minister the gospel of Jesus in their community, in their life. And it was a great time. And then last week, we had our Easter services, and we packed this place out, and we just saw God do some awesome things, uh, people giving their life to Jesus and it's been an awesome month. And what I've recognized, and I really felt it this week, I was telling our staff on Tuesday, I said, you know what, like, it's kind of those moments, I don't know if you ever went to camp or anything like that when you were younger, um, but we always, we talked about this camp high. And it's always seemed like the times that we would come back and we had this awesome experience with Jesus, that those were the moments where the devil would just wanted to plant seeds of doubt in our life. To say, ah, oh, no, it actually wasn't real. You're not really feeling that way. These things are still true in your life. And I recognize that in this week, we're just like, man, like we've had this incredible month of God just doing amazing things. Um, but we can feel that, that the devil doesn't like those things. He doesn't like it when we have months like that. And I don't know if you had an awesome month. Maybe you've had a terrible month, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, we want to make sure that we're staying on the path of following Jesus and seeing that light and, and speaking truth in the midst of what could be darkness in our lives. Um, and I just want to say that as we, as we get into this series, this is an area where I feel like the devil wants to plant those seeds of doubt. 
He wants to tell you, hey, God doesn't make sense. And we're going to spend three weeks in this series. Uh, and the first week what we're talking about today is, is, is this thought of when God doesn't seem, when God seems inattentive. When he seems like he's not listening. When we pray and we pray, but we're like, is he even hearing me? And then next week we're going to talk about uh, when God seems late. I don't know if you ever, you know, we have our time frame, and maybe God's time frame was different. And then the third week, we're going to talk about when God seems uncooperative. And I just want you to raise your hand. If you're in this place and you feel like, I've experienced a time where I felt like God was uncooperative, or he was not listening to me, or he was late. Has anyone ever felt that when you've been dealing with God? Okay, there's hands going up everywhere. It's the right crowd. And there's the thing about, like, Think about when you're in this midst of these feelings, like when you feel like God just is not there right now, other people seem to make it worse, right? You probably have those people in your life group. You're going through your stuff, and you're in a life group, and that one person comes every week with like 10 praise reports. God did this. God did this. God did this. And you're like, awesome. Good for you. Why doesn't he answer my prayers? Where's God for me? How is he always showing up for you, but he's not showing up for me? You know, you, or you hear like pastors preaching messages or missionaries or evangelists and they talk about these incredible hearing, healings and these miracles and you're sitting there thinking, man, my spouse has cancer and we've been praying and praying and praying and, and nothing's happening. Where is God? Where is God in all of this? Why is he answering their prayers? You're hearing these stories and he's doing things for them, but he's not doing things for me. Why isn't he answering my prayers? Why do things go so right for them and not right for me? Is God even paying attention to me? Do you ever have that feeling? Is God actually paying attention? And if you're taking notes, this is the key thought for today, and I hope you'll embrace it. But this is the thought. Just because God is silent does not mean that God is absent. Just because God is silent does not mean that God is absent. Just because you may not hear him does not mean that, de- that he does not hear you. Just because you do not feel his presence does not mean that he is not with you. Just because God is silent does not mean that God is absent. And I want to look in a story today uh, in, the, in the New Testament, Mark, in the book of Mark, Mark 6, actually, is where we're going to be. And uh, this story is pretty challenging in this area of when God doesn't make sense. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't like how this story plays out. I'll just be honest with you, and you'll understand that as we get into it. I don't like how the story plays out. It's not how I would have hoped it would have ended. Um, but we're going to be in Mark 6. You can open it up there with me if you want. Uh, we also will have it up on the screen behind me. And I'm just going to tell you now that if you are in the midst of something right now, if you've lost someone or you are dealing with um, hurt in your own life, uh, this may be a hard message for you. The truth that is going to be told to you today uh, may be hard to understand, and I get that, and, I, and I'm sorry that you're going through something right now, but this is a truth um, that we see in Jesus, and, and it needs to be taught. And so um, we're going to look at a character in the Bible whose name is John the Baptist, Uh, If you're familiar with John the Baptist, awesome. If you're not, uh, I'll give you a little bit of who he was. So he was actually Jesus' cousin. Uh, He... Uh, There's this awesome story in the Bible when John's mother Elizabeth was pregnant with him and Mary, the mother of Jesus, was pregnant with Jesus, that uh, Mary showed up to visit Elizabeth, who was with child, and Mary was with child. And it says in that moment that Mary showed up and she was pregnant, has, you know, the Savior of the world in her stomach, um, that... John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb. And I know I said stomach, and babies aren't actually in stomach. Some of you people are like, (laughs) you know what I mean, in the general area, okay? In the womb. But it says that John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb. I'm like, what an awesome story, like, to see that even before he was born, John the Baptist knew he had something to do with this other guy. And uh, I I love this story. And if if you look you know, fast forward a little bit. Uh, John, he actually was a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah. Uh, spoke of a man who would be uh, the one crying out in the wilderness, making a way for the Lord, making way for the Messiah. And that's what John was. He was this wild man. Um, they tell stories that he wore animal skins and he ate uh, locust and honey as a diet, which is a pretty unique diet. Uh, I imagine it could be kind of healthy. I'm not really sure. Um, I just eat pizza. But he was really, like, popular with common people because he wouldn't take anything from anyone. He would just do what he was supposed to do. And what he did was he told the truth. He was a truth teller, and he wanted to proclaim proclaim the way for Jesus. He was preparing the way for him, and that's all he did. And him being a truth teller is actually what got him in trouble with uh, King Herod Antipas at this time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory, and then we'll read in the scripture. So you got King Herod of Antipas. 
Uh, we're just going to call him King Herod because Antipas is a, it's a hard one to continue to say over and over again. So King Herod, um, he was a married man. Um, he liked his wife. She was nice. Uh, but then he also recognized that his brother's wife was also nice. And he thought he liked her a little bit more than his own wife. So he started flirting with his brother's wife and then divorced his own wife to marry his brother's wife. It gets, it's kind of a weird story. Um, and so he marries her. Her name is Herodias. I guess Herod was a common name at the time. Um, and that's a scandal, right? You got this king who divorces his wife, marries his brother's wife. I mean, I don't know if you watched the show Scandal, but Olivia Pope would be coming in for this. Like, this is, this is a big thing. Like, th- th- this, is, this is a scandal. And this is where John the Baptist actually comes in, and he starts telling them, hey, you're in the wrong. You're not supposed to be doing this. This is not right. And Herodias, you know, the new wife, ex-sister-in-law, uh, she hated John the Baptist for this because you need to recognize she just moved into the role of a queen. She just married the king. And now John is coming in and, and trying to mess with this whole plan. Um, so she wants to get rid of him. She wants to kill him. She's like, hey, Herod, get rid of that guy. He's messing with our stuff. But Herod, he, he didn't want to kill him because he believed that John was a man of God. Uh, he feared him. He's like, uh, I like the way he talks, uh, so I'm not going to kill him, but I will arrest him for you, Herodias. That's what I will do. And if we look in the scripture, Mark 6, starting in verse 17, it says, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. Weird. Uh, for John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. And I, <laughs> I love that last little part there because, you know, Herod's sitting there thinking like, I have no idea what you're saying, John, but I like the way you talk. That's <laughs> probably how some of you guys feel when Pastor Dave is preaching. Um, I'm just kidding. He's a way I can say those kind of things. But he, And so we're sitting here, and if you take a step back and you look at what you have here, so you have John the Baptist who did nothing but point people to Jesus. He was a truth teller. That's what he did. Uh, His calling was to prepare the way for the Lord. And whenever anyone would actually say, hey, we want to follow you, John, he'd say, no, 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 I'm just just a man. Like, you need to follow Jesus. Follow him. He actually says that he was unworthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. Like, he had this reverence for uh, his cousin, this this man, this Messiah uh, that he was serving. He was a truth teller. He baptized people. He actually baptized Jesus. And he was in prison for speaking truth and for standing for Jesus. Like, that's, that's why he was in prison. Now, this is where I want to tie us in a little bit because uh, John's in prison. And if I'm John the Baptist and I'm standing for Jesus and Jesus is doing these miracles, what do I think Jesus is going to do for me? A miracle. John's plan was probably, hey, I'm in prison right now, but... I got Jesus on my side. He'll get me out of here. We'll continue doing the work we're doing. But I'd be sitting in that jail cell, and I'm thinking, man, he's going to come in here any moment, and he's going to break me out of here. But John just waited, and he waited, and he waited, and Jesus didn't break him out. He didn't send some of his new, newly saved followers to break him out. He didn't send some nine-foot angel to come in and with flaming swords and break him out of prison. Jesus just kept doing his ministry, and John waited. And if we take a vote right now, how many of you think that John probably during that time just was, his faith was unwavering, uh, you know, he was, he was strong in his faith during that time? And how many of you think that he would probably be questioning who Jesus was a little bit if he's sitting there in prison? Yeah. So who here doesn't want to raise their hand because they don't know where this is going? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks for your honesty. See, John was a human being. And so no matter how much he had a faith, right? He was this man who was proclaiming the way of Jesus coming. He wavered. He wasn't sure. If you look in Matthew eleven two 2 through 3, this is where we can see it. Uh, it says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? So this man, who was so sure, who leapt in his mother's womb, who was the voice crying out in the wilderness, the truth teller, while he was in prison under Herod Antipas, doubted. He questioned, are you sure? In other words, I've been out there saying, prepare the way, but maybe I was wrong. Jesus, I've been doing all of this, and because you haven't come through for me, 
maybe you aren't the one that I thought you were. And then how did Jesus reply in Matthew 11, verse 4? Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This was his response to John after John was saying, are you sure you're the one? See, he didn't respond by telling John, hey, just hold your horses. I'm working with a lawyer. I'll be there next week to get you out. That's not how he responded. He just told John, hey, all, all, all these things, see, it's happening. Here's the things that prove that I am the one. Now, don't be offended by me. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus continues pushing his message forward, doing miracles, and John is still waiting faithfully. But here's what happens. King Herod throws a kager. And I don't know if he's like an IPA guy or a reporter guy. I'm not really sure exactly how it went. Um, it was probably wine, knowing the time. But he throws this huge party, and he gets drunk. Like drunk, drunk. Like everyone's his new best friend drunk. So King Herod is drunk at this big party that he throws. And if it's not weird enough that he married his brother's wife, it gets even weirder. Because Herodias, his brother's wife, now his wife, sends her daughter Salome in to do a dance for the king. Now, I don't know what kind of dance it was. It could have been a wonderful ballet, or she may have been a big Miley Cyrus fan and it got a little crazy. I'm not really sure. Um, she probably came in on a wrecking ball. But whatever dance it was, King Herod was in awe by it. He loved it. It was the best dance he had ever seen. That was amazing, Salome. I didn't know people could move like that. Like, he was so into this dance that his niece slash stepdaughter just did. Once again, weird. Best dance he'd ever seen. That was amazing. So he brings Salome up in front of his guest, and he says, Salome, that was the best dance ever. You're amazing. I'll give you anything you want. Up to half of my kingdom, you teenage girl, I will give you because your dance was so good. That's not wisdom. So Salome, she's like, cool, cool, okay. Uh, you know, and she looks over at her mom. She's like, what do I want? Like, what, what should, I, should I take half of the kingdom? I mean, that would be fun, right? But in that moment, Herodias is like, no, this is the perfect time. This is the perfect time. We can get him to do the thing that he wasn't going to do. So she told Salome, go to him and say, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so Salome went up to the king and said, hey, here's my request. And it says the king was greatly distressed. He's like, ah. Oh, I didn't know you were going to ask for that. It's the one thing I didn't want to do. But because he was in front of all of his guests, he had to honor it. He's like, okay, let's do it. All right, let's go. Let's go have John beheaded. And this is how I wish the story would end. As the guards are going to kill John the Baptist, there was a mighty earthquake. And an angel of the Lord appears with two flaming swords. And he strikes everyone with blindness except for Herodias. And he says, you, Herodias, you need to see what am I about to do. Then under the fire of the Lord, everyone dies. And at that moment, the shackles fall off of John the Baptist's feet. The doors fly open. The music swells. There's smoke in the air. And he comes out with his face painted blue. And he says, freedom! That's what I wish would have happened. But this is how it actually happened. Immediately after, John was beheaded in the prison, and his head was delivered back to Salome, who handed it to her mother, Herodias. Now, I tell you the false alternate ending, because those kind of things actually happen in the Bible and other stories. I mean, Mel Gibson never came out with blue face paint. But earthquakes happened. Jail cells were flung open. Those things have happened for other people, but it didn't happen for John the Baptist. Now, this doesn't really fit into our American version of Christianity where we think everything is supposed to go right for us if we believe in Jesus, right? Oh, I got the job promotion. I got the new house. I never get sick. I'll be honest with you. My Christian life looks nothing like John the Baptist's Christian life. But if we can take a step back, if we can remove the emotion and look at the story, we actually see that John's desire was fulfilled. John's desire from the get-go was to prepare the way for the Lord. And he actually did that. In the Gospel of John, I was just reading it this last week in my devotion, it said everything John the Baptist spoke of Jesus came to pass. More so, we see that God's purpose was fulfilled. 
the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the gospel would be proclaimed. So what John, and more importantly, what God had purposed, did come to pass. Just may not have looked the way John had thought or the way that John maybe had planned for. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You ask Vinny what his plans were. Probably don't align with the purpose now that Jesus is walking him down. See, I had this plan. I wanted to play professional baseball. If you guys know this about my dad, Dave Edler, he's the pastor here. Uh, he played for the Seattle Mariners, no big deal. But I wanted, to, when I was a kid, I wanted to be, well, maybe not the next Dave Edler. I wanted to be the next Alex Rodriguez. He's a little bit better than my dad was. I wanted to be a professional baseball player, but the thing about me is I have terrible eyesight. I'm extremely farsighted. I wear contacts. And when I was younger, I could not pick up the spin of a baseball if my life depended on it. And if you don't know anything about baseball, I just want you to know, to be a good hitter, you have to be able to pick up the spin of a baseball. You can actually tell what pitch is coming by looking at the baseball. You can know it's a fastball. You can know if it's a curveball, a slider, a changeup. But you can pick up the spin of a baseball. If you have terrible eyesight, it doesn't work so well. So I could never pick up the spin of a baseball. So I struck out all the time. I could not hit the ball out of the infield. I was a terrible hitter. I could, I could play in the field pretty well, but I could not hit. And that's not a really good if I wanted to actually be a professional baseball player. Not many people who can't hit play professional baseball. But my, so my plan wasn't working out the way I thought it would. And actually, you know, a funny story is, gosh, probably eight years ago, I was sitting at a WorldCast conference right here in this, in this building, and I was sitting right over here. And I had this moment where I'm like, you know what, God? I think you want to heal me. I think you want to fix my eyes. So in that moment, I sat there, and I took my contacts out of my eyes, and I threw them on the ground. <laughs> my eyes closed. I opened them, like, oh, no, everything's really blurry. It was a moment, like, shoot. <laughs> now I can't see. It was, like, right at the beginning of the message, too, so I had to sit through the whole thing, not seeing anything. I'm like, how am I getting home? This is terrible. But my plan is not always what God's purpose was. And you don't have to understand the plan to trust God's purpose. I didn't follow my dad's footsteps to play professional baseball. I have followed in his footsteps to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has different size feet than me, so I walk in different shoes than he does, and I'm proud of that. But God has a purpose for my life, and I get to walk in that. See, some of you had plans, and they were great. They were great plans. You were heading there, but then something derailed you. Right? Sickness derails, death derails, the economy derails, losing your job derails, mental illness derails, chronic, chronic headaches derail. And while we pray and we pray and we pray, it doesn't go away. You don't understand, God, why? This is my plan. Why? You don't have to understand the plan to still trust God's purpose. He is still good. And this is something put in your notes, and it's really important that you get this. We do not interpret the goodness of God through our circumstances. We interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God. Let me say that again. We do not interpret the goodness of God through our circumstances. We interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God. And this is the one of those things that causes many people to walk away from their faith. Because they're interpreting the goodness of God based off their circumstances. God is good. Believe that God is still good. He is always good. God cannot be anything but good. We don't have to understand everything to continue to trust in God. And when you come to a time when it doesn't make sense, which it will, and if you're like me, you're like, okay, God, what's the plan? What are you doing here? I need to know, make it clear. God may respond to you by saying this, trust my purpose. Remember, many are the plans in a person's heart but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So for me, my faith is no longer in my plan. My faith is in God's purpose. I stop trying to lead God into my plan by saying, hey, Jesus, follow me. Follow me. I stopped doing that. It wasn't working. But now I stand with my hands open and I say, God, what is your purpose for my life? I want to walk in that. Whatever it may be, whatever it may come, I want to be in your purpose. His ways are higher. His ways are wiser. 
I am not the center of the universe, as much as I try to tell my wife that I am. I'm not. I'm not the main actor in this play. I'm here to serve God and to glorify him through and through. So even when God seems silent, it does not mean that he is absent. He is there. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, God, thank you for hard truths. <laughs> that even in the darkest times, you are still present, God. That in the times where we feel like we can't feel you, that you're still there right with us, God. Remind us that you're right by our side. Lord, when we are crying, you're crying with us. When we're in desperate times, you're there holding our hands. God, just because you may seem silent doesn't mean that you are absent. Lord, I pray for uh, faith. Faith that even in the times where it seems hard, we can believe that your purpose is greater than our plans. Lord, in the times where we feel like you don't make sense, that we remember that Jesus did something for us that doesn't make sense either. That he died for us so that we could walk in the freedom, walk in salvation, walk in the future of hope. Can I pray for anyone who's in a low place in life, God, that they're just going through it right now, that they will remember that you are good. No matter what, you are good. If you're here in this place and you're, you're having a hard time, uh, you feel like you're walking through hell a little bit, I want you to know and I want to encourage you to lean on Jesus. Lean on him. He's right there with you. I also want to give an opportunity that if you're in this place and, and you've never experienced the love of God. You've never said yes to Jesus. You've never walked in this truth. You've never walked in the freedom that only he can bring. Today's the day you need to make a decision to follow him. The most important decision you can ever make in your life is saying yes to Jesus. So if you're here, everyone has their eyes closed. No one's looking around. If you're here and you say, man, I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to give my life to him. If you do that, will you just raise your hand right where you're at? Say, today's the day I need to make a decision to follow him. Awesome. Walk in this truth, my friends. God is good no matter what. And even when he seems silent, it does not mean that he's absent. He's right there with you. Lord, I pray your blessing over everyone in this place, God. Continue to be moving, God. We want to see your, your move. We want to see the move of the Spirit in our valley, in our city, God, in our schools, in our churches, in our government, Lord, all these places. Lord, we just, we want to see you moving. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.